This is Jesse. This is Sean. And welcome to GenderCast, our trans masculine gender query. Join us as we discuss our journey through gender expression, trans masculine culture, identity, and navigating the binary in our communities. Welcome to GenderCast, episode 16. We're here with three folks that are going to be doing an interview with Sean and I today around bisexuality and the binary, or are we all just queer? Just, right. We're going to have our panel introduce themselves because there's three of them, and uh, Sean and I are also going to sort of weigh in around what we're asking the panel to talk about because we are talking a bit about our own gender identity and then what we're attracted to and what's attracted to us. And so just... Also to own some privilege, everyone here today is white. Uh, we don't have a person of color on our panel, uh, yet another limitation that we have at GenderCast that we're working on. And I'm gonna go first. So my gender identity, as all of you know, is gender queer, gender variant. And I am attracted to anyone assigned female sex at birth, but is on the trans masculine spectrum. We'll have a fun dialogue about what that means I am. <laughs> and I'm gonna hand it off to our first guest. Hi, I'm Maddox. Uh, my gender identity language is constantly shifting around this, but today I will say that my gender identity is femme trans guy. And I'm attracted to kind of anybody. <laughs> I don't really put limitations on that. I tend to be attracted to the individual rather than like having a predefined attraction to a certain sex or a certain gender. I tend to be lately attracted to people that are more gender variant, though this can take many, many different forms. Okay, I am Kayla. My gender identity is female, cisgendered, if you will. I am attracted to a wide range of people. I identify as bisexual, and I don't really put any limitations on who I date either. Yeah, I'm gonna leave it at that. My name is Amy. I am uh, female born, so also cisgendered, if you will. And uh, I identify as the commonly known bisexual. I prefer the term pan or queer. I am attracted to the wide variety of the gender spectrum. I have dated a variety of different types of folks. Lately, I seem to be dating mostly female-born, female-identifying people. I'm Sean, and I identify as trans butch, I guess is the terminology I've found most correct these days, or gender cast coined dude bro. And I'm typically attracted to cis women and have dated bisexual identified persons in the past. Okay, so you've heard from Maddox, Kayla, and Amy a little bit about where they're coming from and where they're at in terms of their own gender identity and who they're attracted to. And I'm just going to say a little bit about why we wanted to do this episode. I read a blog post a while back, and we'll post this, of course, like we always do. The blogger is biradical, and the blog post was words binary and biphobia, or why is bi binary but F to M is not. And so you can gather from the name of that blog post what we're wanting to talk about today, of course, and that is, um, is bisexuality binary? Is that a binary identity? And does that mean by default that somebody that identifies as bisexual is sort of perpetuating this whole binary that we're trying to challenge? Or on the other note of that, one thing that we've talked about is I, Jesse, having had a history of being bisexual, I actually identified that way for probably five years. Is that an identity that is more welcoming to the trans community? And I've always heard that. And it's just something you kind of hear here and there that people that identify as bisexual or a lot of trans people may wind up dating people that are bisexual because that's a community that's more welcoming. So I'm going to ask the three of these folks to respond to that. In terms of language, is bisexuality distinct from being queer? Is queer different? And I think that's the dialogue that we're really wanting to have today around identity and then also getting at when we talk about it from a shared oppression standpoint how are, how is it the same and how is it different so i think initially what we're going to cover is talking about identity and identity politics and sort of where this all falls together around the binaryism of bisexuality whether it's binary or not we are going to hear from the panel and i think as you hear from them you're going to understand why we have this array of folks here today so what we tried to do was get a good array kind of across the spectrum of bisexual queer and then somebody that also identified within that range but more with amy identifying as pansexual which we think is another one or i think is another identity that's at play here and so let's talk first about the language 
and where bisexuality, being bisexual, claiming that identity is different from queer. And so Maddox identifies as queer and Kayla identifies as bisexual. So we're going to hear them first talk about the thinking behind that identity and how they came to arrive there and what else plays into that. And so in that also around identity, of course, if there's a political element to it. And for some people there is and for some people there's not, and that's okay. Okay, so as Jesse said, I identify as queer. To be upfront, when I first came out, I identified as bisexual, but that changed a couple years in as I became more interested in queer studies. So for me, part of the reason I identify as queer is definitely a political alignment and certain intellectual interests. The term queer, I'm a person who's very interested in the etymology of words and how they developed and what they've meant prior to what they mean now. And the term queer has not only meant gay or non-heterosexual, but it's also meant someone something that is unique or something that jeopardizes something. It puts something at jeopardy. It's something that causes, that has like a risk associated with it. And for me, I really identify with that part of the language in that what does my identity as a queer person put at risk? What does it jeopardize? And I really like to embrace that aspect of it and thinking that there are certain institutions, certain dynamics in play in terms of the heteropatriarchy that I enjoy having my identity put in jeopardy. And I want to con constantly challenge that, constantly challenge the binary system, constantly challenge the heteronormativity, heteropatriarchy. And that is part of my identity, part of my sexuality, something I enjoy about my identity and really embrace. And while I don't think that bisexuality necessarily doesn't encompass that because I really do believe that it can. For me, I feel more at home with the word queer and its historical roots. Yeah. So heteropatriarchy, it's kind of a combination of heterosexism and patriarchy. There's a really good article that talks about white heteropatriarchy that I can link you up to, but I don't have on me. But it's, it's the concept that not only, well, I guess that sexism and patriarchy and heterosexism are very linked and that they each support each other. So it's the melding of those two words. And often you'll see like white heteropatriarchy in that also within that white supremacy is very much entwined with that. So we see the lifting of white cisgendered straight men in this society and really on the backs of people who are other than that. Yeah, there's an article that I can, I can link you to that talks about those intersections. So if we are talking about how queer is different than bisexual, there are a few things that come to mind. So first of all, I actually want to say that I highly identify with a lot of what Maddox just said. Part of me struggles and has struggled in the past and probably will continue to struggle in the future with the separation of the terms bisexual, queer, pansexual, because I really am sick of the sorting everybody in the LGBT community apart and making us fight against each other, because I just don't think that's the point of a community. Maddox just kind of said horizontal hostility, which is great. That's, that's, I don't want to like buy into that anymore. So the main reason that I identify as bisexual is because it took me a while to come into my sexuality. When I was growing up, I didn't hugely question my sexuality. I was just attracted to women and I was tr attracted to men. When I was growing up, I didn't know anybody who was trans. That just wasn't on the radar in my small little town. And then I went to school and I met trans folks and there was no one who was identifying openly as bisexual, but I did, you know, because I was dating women and I was dating men and I had never dated someone who was trans at that point. And that wasn't because I was against it, but that was just because it was new to me and I was in a relationship. And I really came to identify strongly as bisexual because I was so sick of the pushback that I got. So kind of the same thing that Maddox was saying about queer, how queer is like going against, challenging the norm and all that. That's how I feel about bisexuality. That is like such a huge thing that I identify with. 
I'm sick of people asking, will you choose a team? Or, and that's such a, such a stereotypical thing to say that I'm sick of, but, but it is true that I think that that's the pushback that people get through identifying as bisexual. That's actually a really good point around choosing a team because I feel like that's something where people that identify as bisexual and trans people have a lot in common, especially trans right. people that aren't trying to have what I call a destination gender mm -hmm. of yes. a binary gender. And so the more I think about bisexuality and queerness and gender altogether, the more, I mean, I love the word queer because I just feel like it's so encompassing. But when I think about the word bisexual and what, there's so much that they're like parallel. I feel like trans community and, and bisexual community are so parallel in a lot of the challenges that they have. And you're, I feel like you were just speaking to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of historical context to the word bisexual, the term bisexual, and I don't want to walk all over that history and to say that there isn't a lot of positive stuff that has come from bisexual organizing. I think it is one of the most open terms that we had for a really long time, and I don't think that by identifying as bisexual that you have to buy into the binary. That's a lot of B in one sentence, <laughs> but that, that is how I feel. So one of the things I just heard Kayla mention as well as this article that we referenced earlier about why bi is binary but FTM is not, one of the things they argue is that people that identify as bisexual have kind of had the transphobic type of narrative placed on them because they're presumed to only see two genders and that they're reinforcing this system we're looking to dismantle. So I think that while that may be the case with some individuals and some politics that have been aligned historically, I don't, I feel like we are talking about how even that identifying with that doesn't, you don't lose solidarity in what you actually think politically. It's about self-identification, which, you know, we've talked about many times on this podcast is very important. But I think that Kayla was kind of speaking to that, that it doesn't have to be aligned with transphobia. But I also think that that partly comes in to just like what we've talked about with previous feminist movements and even with the Butch Voices conversation we had last time about marginalized communities, the larger voice always wants to make themselves more marginalized and really negate the fact that other people have additional obstacles that they're facing. So the gay and lesbian movement has been the main narrative for so long to obtain rights for us and, and legislation and all that stuff that it sometimes feels that the other marginalized, the, the B, the Q, the T, that we're always fighting for one spot, that it can, it's either lesbian, gay, and then something else, and we've got to fight amongst each other to get our narrative in or our rights spoken to. So I think that that's what we're talking about here too. Yeah, for sure. In fact, there's a quote in the article where she actually talks about the fact that we as a movement have been focusing on this question as a central one implies a political hierarchy that prioritizes transgender issues over bisexual issues because she's speaking to kind of coming and it's funny we were talking Maddox and I were and Sean were talking before we started the podcast we were talking about coming from a place of scarcity that there's only enough to have one more community sort of rise to it and and start fighting for rights in addition to the GNL and you'll hear us talk about that a lot the difference between the GNL the sort of the, the headlining of the group that gets gets sort of the most the gay and lesbian versus the B and the T and the Q. So with that idea of kind of the B and the T competing for who's going to be the most marginalized population and who can rise up, I think that that was kind of my original reaction at first in, in some of the organizing that I've done. Jesse and I were in a leadership program together and a lot, we had panels on a diversity day about trans identity and queer identity. And I'm thinking to myself, this is really great. Like, this is great that a lot of people have never been exposed to these different gender variations and all of these people are speaking to some really great things. But why is no one talking about bisexuality? If we're going to call ourselves an LGBT leadership program, like I want to hear something about the bisexual aspects because I had this sinking feeling of like, oh, they're the bigos sinking below the T. And I know that that is such like a controversial statement to say and like makes me kind of sound like a shithead. That is uh, just like a personal reaction that I had and I think that that happens. And so now coming here today and talking to these people on the panel and like listening to what Maddox was saying, I'm just more so identifying with the commonalities that all of it have and that we really do have very similar politics and just wanting to drive forward the LGBT 
Q movement, whether we're just going to call it the queer movement, like that doesn't necessarily have to be the problem. I think it's really interesting that you said that because one of the quotes from this article is actually speaking to Dean Spade's often linkage of LGP and fake T with the assumption of that even in that statement, the B gets the same airtime as the L and the G and they're, they're part of this oppressive group. We obviously know that's not, not true. We should say, but we love Dean Spade. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're sort of, we're not and we are answering our own question as we go along because just what Kayla was talking about in terms of language, like... The more I think about bisexuality and then I think about queer, and can't queer just be the word that everybody can rally around because this seems like the most encompassing word. And then I was reading another blog post last week that we're actually going to post a link to, and I know Maddox read this one too, that talked about what queer actually means. And then so maybe... Maybe, maybe people that are identify as bisexual may, may not fall under the queer radar, but I think we're getting in that total fucking ditch of language again, where it's like we fall into it and it becomes this thing that is this huge barrier to us coming together around a shared oppression. And I think in that shared oppression, meaning that we're attracted to a continuum of gender, we're attracted to a variety of gender, we're not attracted to just one little needle point on the map and that's what makes us queer and makes us bisexual and so how do we get around that how do we come together and not have these identity politics these identity like differences so one thing this is Maddox again one thing I want to add to this is that I feel very often we talk about bisexuality and queer and trans as though these are all mutually exclusive (laughs) categories and it is possible to be bisexual and queer it is possible to be trans and bisexual it is possible to be trans and queer it's possible to be all of them together (laughs) so it's not these are not firm categories as though there are walls set up between each of these and you know there's no blending and i think like that's really important to remember that these categories seep. We have crossover. Yeah, so they're not mutually exclusive. So I think it's important when we talk about language that we remember that not everybody defines themselves in such clear cut terms and that we don't have to be in separate camps. I think that's actually a really good segue into what we're going to have Amy talk about. And that's around being attracted to a really broad spectrum and sort of how that relates back in terms of who we're attracted to, how that relates back to our own identity, and then just navigating that all when, I mean, the real kind of meat of this is like, well, how we're trying to navigate like dating and we're trying to navigate relationships with other people. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of this episode is sort of getting in that terrain a little bit and other than the sex desire attraction episode three we haven't really talked about this we've really made gender identity more of you know we've talked about it in terms of our own personal thing but we're talking about how our gender is basically at play with the rest of the world here and what that looks like and how we talk about that so we're gonna have amy way in here i think that well it's really interesting you're talking about terminology and as i think about terminology and how I've become educated in terminology over the years, that I've probably actually been bisexual longer than I really like knew. I mean, I knew that bisexual was a term, but I'd never been with a female-bodied person, so, or just never like had found one that I was attracted to enough to. But then I did date and was with for several years, somebody who was transgendered. Um, But at that time, I never considered that could be falling under like a bisexual identity. So until I dated a female born body, I didn't even encompass that. To clarify, when I say female born, that would be female sex assigned at birth. I have dated both person who is transitioning to male and also female who, who identifies as female cisgender. So I have a lot of frustration around the terminology and as I came into that, it's like, okay, well, because before when I was like, oh, well, females women, beautiful, lovely, like dancing and snuggling with them, but I don't feel like anything else with them at this point. And so I just called myself bisexual. So I just figured that was good. So now I'm in bisexual terminology land, and yet still I feel frustrated by that because my attraction is not to 
just one or the other, but rather the variance of gender expression. And so I find it very attractive, someone who is comfortable with their masculine and their feminine. And I have dated men who are more feminine and women who are more masculine and transgender bodies. And so the binary doesn't feel to me like it really fits. And then pan is just this kind of weird term that I use because it, under definition, fits this gender spectrum. Not either or, neither nor, here or there. And still, that just seems like, I like to say equal opportunist. <laughs> Multi-gender attracted. I don't know. And nothing, it, it always comes out complicated in some complicated terminology. Queer is kind of fun because it does express this definitely like a doesn't fit either here or there in the box kind of thing and even that the whole terminology land is frustrating for me and just try to have conversations with people and some kind of terminology that they would understand usually and kind of gauge that well and then when you're in like naked with somebody it's a whole nother land of language anyway right i mean we're this is sort of like an intellectualizing of it I just, it's, it'd be interesting to hear, it's like when you're actually in the bedroom, like what language you're using, because then you're navigating bodies and bodies are so different. So we're going to go into talking, we have some specific questions for Kayla and Maddox and Amy that we're going to ask them to speak to. And then we're going to talk a little bit about, a little, actually a little bit more about navigating relationships and some experiences they've had around that. So Maddox, if your gender identity is fluid, how does that affect your sexual orientation being more fluid? And you spoke to that a little bit when you were first sort of introducing yourself, but we'd like you to delve into that a little bit more. I think this question really kind of gets to why, part of the reason why I identify as queer, because it makes it really a lot easier <laughs> in that you don't have to constantly be redefining. So, and I've written a little bit about this in the past around how gender fluidity can inform sexuality and inform the language that one uses. So right now I present more masculine, although with a femme twist to that, I really identify with the word fag. And I am dating someone who is a cisgender man. Am I a gay man? If I then present in a different way one day, does that change the gayness of my identity? The language that I use for myself can change sometimes daily. For myself, that is something that I, I like to embrace and that is part of the queerness. I enjoy questioning the stability of those terms for myself. And this is, when I talk about these things, I it's really important for me to emphasize the fact that this is for myself. I don't believe that everybody has an unstable identity or a fluid identity or that all identities should be fluid, but that for myself, that is the case. And that's something I like about myself and value about myself. And it's taken me a long time to come to the place where it is something that I view as a positive aspect of my identity rather than as something to be ashamed about as though I am constantly in a phase or I can't make up my mind. But the fact that I have a wide range of options and I'm willing to be playful is something that's positive about my sexuality. So the, one of the other things we wanted to get to is having uh, an identity that encompasses various genders or more than one gender, does that pose specific obstacles when dating or when you come out as having a wide array of attraction to people? Does that, do you feel like it has some baggage that comes along with it when you talk to this about your partners or, or in relationships? So for myself, I feel like I haven't really had much difficulty in terms of problems around my being attracted to multiple types of people. I think mostly because I've dated other people that have been attracted to multiple types of people. That generally is who has been attracted to me as well. So that's worked out nicely. The issues that I've encountered have been around people defining my gender for me and having fluid gender being something where I've encountered similar types of kind of narrative in terms of around biphobia in terms of it's just a phase or you you are just confused you know like that type of like 
discriminatory type of language around my gender in terms of like, oh, it's just a phase that you are identifying this way or you are confused or you don't really know your gender identity or I can see that you are this way and you're just not seeing yourself clearly. I've encountered that from people more than I've encountered issues around who I am attracted to. So Kayla, same question for you in that your thoughts on dating trans and gender queer folks and then obstacles that you have come up in navigating dating different types of folks. So my sexual identity is fluid. So I date people who identify as varying genders, male, female, trans, what have you. I mean, whatever gender you're going to identify as is probably going to be okay with me. My gender identity is not fluid. I fluctuate in terms of if I'm more masculine or more feminine. I am highly attracted to a wide range of people, though. I am very attracted to androgynous people. That doesn't mean that that person is going to identify as trans. They could be just androgynous in their appearance and be identifying as a cisgendered female. I don't know why I just went on that. I don't know. Watched G.I. Jane the other day. Um... (laughs) I think obstacles that I've run into in my dating career have, have have begun. I mean, the number one obstacle that I have encountered as identifying as bisexual is the whole, like, bisexuals need not apply. On so many dating sites, it's like, I'm a lesbian, I won't date bisexuals. Like, I'm a gay man, I won't date bisexuals. Like, people are just not interested in it because I don't, I don't know what it is. I think it's different for different people. Okay, so I'm currently dating a bisexual, cisgendered man, and I think that at first, when I was dating him, I was nervous about his being bisexual, which isn't that interesting that I was, I was nervous that he was identifying as bisexual. <laughs> and, and I think that the reason that I was nervous wasn't because I was thinking, oh, you're bisexual, you're all of the stereotypes that fit into being bisexual. It was just different. It was different. I was in a new relationship, and it was a trust issue. Like, do I trust you as my partner? I'm trying to, like, get at the fact that, like, I understand why people are nervous about dating different sexual identities, but I think it's more of just, like, a relationship trust thing. I think that in most of my dating experiences, with each new person that you're dating, you're going to come into different obstacles, and you're going to have to learn a lot about that person in order to gain trust. So dating somebody who has a different gender or has a different sexual orientation is going to open yourself up to new opportunities. And with that, there are going to be new obstacles to overcome, new things to be nervous about and excited about. So I understand why somebody might at first be nervous about dating someone who's bisexual. I I just don't think it's fair to stereotype an entire population as one thing versus another, just as I don't think it's fair to stereotype any community. Find out their personal history. Find out, you know, because that could actually be a really interesting person to could deprive, be depriving yourself of a really amazing experience. That's an awesome point. And I also wonder, with bisexuality, I know that when I was identifying that way, one thing that you always heard was like, when when is the other shoe going to drop? When are you going to wind up wanting somebody of the other gender? And so the person that you're with is not enough. And that whole, that, that kind of concept of scarcity and, and people's own insecurities and sort of playing into that. And it reminds me a lot, as you were all talking, I was thinking about the difficulty in navigating polyamory and navigating multiple relationships, because part of what this sort of is playing into, or at least I feel like sort of the unspoken thing that we haven't said yet is that maybe sometimes part of being bisexual and being, it's not just being about attracted to a sort of whole spectrum of genders and whether that's embodied in one person or not, but also a spectrum of different people and being more open to that. And maybe some of the phobia around that and speaking about biphobia is if you're with somebody that's bisexual and you're, you are insecure and thinking that maybe they're going to want that other shoe is going to drop. Maybe that's about navigating relationships and not, not so much about that person's identity. And it's like, it's your own insecurities around that. And so I think that speaks more to the biphobia aspect of it. I was going to say, I remember, I think it, it is partially a generational component. I want to say that when I was a newbie in my queer life, the lesbian community really wanted to ostracize and set themselves apart from bisexuals. And really, there was a lot of fear around dating them based on the fact, like you guys already talked about, that all of a sudden, because people, I think it was just about 
the knowledge of being more sexual. Like if someone's admitting that they're they're attracted to more than one type of of sex, or they are um, open to having uh, a non monogamous or polyamorous relationship, that because they're owning their sexuality and acknowledging it, that somehow the old school stereotype like one true love is broken and therefore of course you would just leave me on a dime and it would because I couldn't provide something that you wanted or their own insecurities but I think that the transphobia as well just like it with if anybody is willing to identify that they're not going to be in some rigid box there's always this feeling that either the person doesn't know what they want because they're not subscribing to what X percentage of the population is and that's what we see on TV that's what we've been taught that's what we hear about so anybody that's going to step outside that box whether it's in the partners they choose or in the gender they choose and live in a different life and it feels good for them it's threatening to us because it's destabilizing everything that we know as society and everything that we know is what a relationship looks like what a person's gender looks like and uh, i think that's what, what the issues are it's our own stuff so i think this is a really good time because we were talking about marriage earlier and i think maddox can weigh in here really well but it, it just reminds me of Pick one, pick one gender so you can pick one partner so you can be just like us and have this life where you're with that one person in a monogamous, privileged relationship and you can get married and be with that person forever. And it's like, I think a lot around queer identity and maybe Maddox can speak to this too, is getting away from those oppressive systems that, you know, maybe marriage is perpetuating that oppressive system and the way that our families are set up can be different. Uh, one of the things that we were talking about before we started recording was that in that concept about marriage and also the concept about kind of like GL versus BT rights and how the gay and lesbian community currently a lot of the focus has been on marriage and marriage equality and whether or not that is really the right that the B and T are looking for. And this is where the comments about what Dean Spade was writing about the B isn't necessarily in on that marriage equality bandwagon, perhaps, at least not everybody who identifies as bisexual, maybe, because at least how I understand it is that many bisexual people also identify as polyamorous and may not be searching for a single partner. Marriage rights kind of perpetuates this concept of monosexism, another word for <laughs> to add to the list. I tend to be that type of person. <laughs> so with the concept that, you know, we are all meant to be with one person, that there is that mythic soulmate out there, which we are going to create our life together and then have children and so on. And that many of us actually don't want that. We don't want the single person and that families can be structured in very different ways. We can have families structured as community with multiple parents, with, you know, multiple partners, with households that are structured, you know, in a more communal way. And in that way, the marriage equality rights don't really serve us because they perpetuate privileging of this one type of family which may not be the type of family that we wish to create for ourselves, particularly in that many of us were rejected by that very type of family. And so we're searching to create a different kind of structure. And I think that in that way, the bisexual, queer, and trans community definitely have a link up in terms of rights that we are seeking with the ability to create the kind of structure, kind of society, kind of community that we want to live in with rights, but not necessarily saying, I need to be just like you in order to have these rights. And I think that very often that's also where the backlash from the GNL part of the LGBT comes from in that we are not just like them. Jillian Todd Weiss in an article on GL versus BT talks about the kind of double-edged sword of being too queer and not queer enough in that there's often you hear like, oh, well, bisexual and trans people get heterosexual privilege because of invisibility around the identity when we are with someone who appears to be of the quote-unquote opposite gender or sex, and we may appear to be in a heterosexual relationship when I'm dating someone who is of a different gender than my own. That doesn't mean that my relationship is automatically a heterosexual one. It's still a queer one because I am queer. 
so you end up being said that you're not queer enough because of that so-called privilege that we may or may not be given and then too queer in that that desire to structure structural relationships differently, not perhaps married, perhaps being into kink, being into polyamory, into all of these things that mark us as different from that heteronormative, which then doesn't serve in that struggle for the rights in which like the focus has historically been saying that we are just like you, except that we are we sleep with someone whose genitals are the same as ours. <laughs> Generally that's how it's been presented. And I think that where bisexual, queer, and trans folks lie, like in that struggle, is saying, like, actually, no, that's not true. We are not the same. We don't want necessarily to be the same. And that's not a fault. That's not a lacking. That's actually a source of pride. And kind of owning that pride, owning that difference, and having it be something that's, at least for me, a joyful part of my identity that I don't need to be like a straight couple in order to be happy. So that really makes me think of the monstrosity of a category that Dean Spade talks about in terms of we want to be just like you and look, we're not over here like all of those other people like criminals or people that are into kink or people that are doing um, navigating polyamory because those are the, the others that we don't want to be like and you should pass these laws so we can have marriage because we are just like you. So it made me think of that. The other thing it makes me think about is when Sean and I first started this podcast, we were talking about trans people kind of being the queers queer. And it, this really circles me back to that and thinking about how we are sort of like the renegades. We're sort of the ones kind of paving new territory and making, redefining the way that family, what family is to us and redefining what gender is and really sort of outside of I'll use your word heteronormativity, but outside of like whatever has been normalized, I mean, we use that word too, but whatever's been normalized out there is, you know, the bullshit that you see when you turn on the TV, basically, <laughs> unless it's something like, you know, alternative or anti mainstream media that all that crap that you see, even trying to make Chaz this fucking dancing with the stars shit. I mean, come on. Anyway, so it's, it kind of makes me think back to that, the queer's queer and sort of why we're, why we do this anyway, and the language that we use and why we claim it and what that means beyond just who we're sleeping next to. I, I just kind of feel the same way about um, some of the things that were said. And what comes to mind is just how intimidating non-conformity is to people. If you can't put somebody into a box, it is intimidating to a, a large population. And so Maddox is saying that we don't want to conform and that is like it's positive to not be able to conform and to, to not want to fit into a stereotype and to to kind of push those boundaries and with that i think it's very interesting i think everybody has boundaries of some sort and we're always those boundaries are going to be pushed so for some people watching an episode of modern family is a very risque sort of like look at this gay couple like these two white gay men adopting a a baby who's not white like that's wow, I am really doing something here. Like, that that's like a risky business for some people. You know, for some people, not conforming to any gender or sexual orientation is going to be risky. And and to explain that to someone else is going to be hard. I, I have known people and loved people who really just understand that I'm bisexual and can appreciate that. But if I'm going to talk to them about dating somebody who's trans, they're just going to it's too much. It's too much for certain people. And I'm going to push those boundaries. But for that person, their head is about to explode. <laughs> it's an interesting conversation to have with different people. And I think the most important thing to me is just continuing to push those boundaries and continuing to talk about those things and to not apologize for where I'm coming from and to not put myself in a box for a minute because it's going to make someone feel better. So, I mean, that's the most important thing to me. As a bisexual person, I am bisexual, right? Uh, that's how I identify. I don't want to go to my boyfriend's house and say, look at us, the nice straight couple, because we're a bisexual couple. And that's something that I'm navigating on a, on a daily basis. Like, and I think that we all are. You know, there, there are certain situations where you're going to be uncomfortable presenting a certain way. And you have to make a rapid judgment and a rapid decision on how you're going to identify and to me, that's, that's the most important part of this conversation, that Maddox is always identifying as queer. I'm always identifying as bisexual. Amy is identifying as pansexual, you know, but we're identifying in a certain way, and we're, we're doing that not just to push others' boundaries, but because it's important to us, and we want other people to appreciate that and to understand that.
This is Amy. I just have to piggyback on the whole um, out of the box thing and how I think it's fascinating that in our culture we applaud and encourage out of the box thinking when it comes to business, marketing, all things related to business, business world and personal growth that's not sexual. <laughs> and our culture uses sex to sell things like it's going out of style. And yet, when we want to live something that's out of the box and, and of the heteronormativity, so to speak, category, this is not something that our culture necessarily applauds. And there's a huge miss in that for me. So the systematics, again, one thing I want to also touch on that idea of boxes and with identity. And I, I feel like it's not only with necessarily sexual orientation and gender, but that we do this like across the spectrum with identities. I mean, we've all are familiar with, you know, census forms and different types of forms that we have to fill out constantly in this world and which like we have to check all of these boxes and which, and I feel like that there's this concept out there that that we have an idea of that we know what a gay person is or we know what a straight person is or we know what someone who's middle class is or you know we know what someone who is white means and there's so much variation among these categories within these categories and that intersectionality you know of our identity causes that I may say that I am white, but my queerness informs how I understand my whiteness, you know, just as my whiteness, you know, informs how my queerness is presented. My class informs both of those and all of these interact with each other so that these boxes no longer really, I feel like, can necessarily inform someone as to exactly who I am. You know, if you look at all of these different things that I check out on whatever that piece of paper is, you know, if you take the individual one, I don't think you'll understand the whole at all. And yet we, there's this concept that we just add more categories, add more options that will somehow get a clearer picture of the person. But that I think that invisibilizes the ways in which all of these different identity categories interact with each other. So one of the things that just comes up for this is just basically I think we all need to do a better job of checking our assumptions. I mean, I have this dialogue. I'm, for one, have am finding myself in this weird spot in life in the sense that because I was gender nonconforming, I was visibly always outside of the box. And now that I'm appearing more male, I'm all of a sudden in this box, which I don't ask for, but it's not like the person that's, you know, waiting on me at the the coffee shop ask me to identify and then they get it. So I think that we just need to be really careful around people's boxes, whether it be related to privilege, whether it be related to sexuality or gender, and uh, constantly kind of meet the world with an open perspective and be flexible. What I was thinking about was in terms of navigating relationships and in terms of trying to have sort of this attraction to the array of gender we're all pretty much kind of navigating the same thing and we're also experiencing in the world a certain oppression around that, Spe kind of speaking back to what Kayla was saying and what Amy was saying around people not being comfortable with that because of our heteronormative and monosexist society. Mm -hmm. So really, regardless of language or regardless of sort of the gluten identity around that, which I understand can be political and can and have a very charged meaning, we're kind of facing this a lot of the similar stuff in the world and that we can come together around that and i think that was the purpose of really doing this episode that regardless of identifying as bisexual or queer there's so much commonality and that we can support each other around that for the last question we have uh it's for amy and as we've talked about so often our sexual orientation is presumed by who we're partnering with at the time so Amy, for your experience having dated someone that identified as trans masculine and trans feminine, how has that affected your identity? My sexual identity is not fluid. If I'm dating a woman, a female born or female sex assigned at birth, someone who identifies as a lesbian, say, I don't consider, I don't suddenly call myself gay. If I'm dating a transgendered man, I don't suddenly call myself heterosexual. 
I'm still bisexual or pansexual. My sexual identity does not change. It is not fluid. The type of person that I'm attracted to is very fluid. I'm very attracted to people who are comfortable and expressive of a variance of gender fluidity and spectrum. And so now to wrap things up, we're going to end um, on a bit of a funnier, steamy note. So just for the for all of the uh, people on the panel today, all of our guests, what traits do you find attractive in people you are seeking to date? And does how you do gender shift with your various partners? So the question is, what do I find attractive and how does my gender performance change? If it does, I, yeah, my gender performance changes depending on the person. It's not necessarily dependent on that other person's gender identity. Just, I guess, like what I feel like with that person or in that moment. Um, so it can shift quite a bit. So I don't really have like, oh, with this type of person, I'm always this. I think for myself, things that I find really attractive are willingness to play with gender no matter how the other person identifies, whether or not they identify as cisgender or trans or something other, I really do like an openness to gender play and performance. I'm also, and this is probably something that people can guess about me, um, I'm really attracted to intellectual discussion and being challenged that way, and I can find that really, really hot, and if that can translate somehow into the bedroom, that's really great just to constantly, you know, have my mind broadened along with my sexuality, you know, it's like those two are very linked for me. Right now I'm with someone who is more petite and that's really great. I can lift him up and throw him around if I would like, and that's really wonderful. <laughs> I know, uh, but you know, it's like, but um, I'm attracted to a you know, large range of people. I don't feel like that there's one body type that I'm attracted to or that there's a body type that I am not attracted to. Another thing that I feel is important in terms of my sexuality is is disability in terms of uh, having fibromyalgia. So how my sexuality will play out in the bedroom is very much dependent on how my body feels at that time and what I'm capable of doing. So that's another element that gets thrown in there. So people who are willing to have like different types of sexual experiences and are not looking for a body that'll perform in the same way every time, that's really important. Like some people I've met have an expectation that you can do certain things and that you are like that you should always be capable and sometimes it's like actually i can't because my hands are fucking really hurting today so i i can't use them you know is there something else i can use that will be okay so an openness to that things that i find attractive in partners i would also agree that sexual openness and a willingness to play play with gender or play with sexuality and to just not i guess not always expect the same things to happen like i am very interested in opening my world to new sexual experiences and i want to be with a partner who feels the same way so i want p to be bringing new things to the table new ideas and i want my partner to be doing the same thing Something that is interesting to me right now about this conversation about sex and what we like is how much we're intellectualizing <laughs> our, what we do in the bedroom. And I feel like that's a lot of what happens when you talk about gender and sexuality, and especially when you're talking about the B and the T, because it is more difficult for people to talk about those subjects, perhaps, that we intellectualize them so that we're kind of beating around the bush in a way. So, on the subject of beating around the bush, things that I like in the bedroom... <laughs> Let's see, I like, um, you know, I do enjoy a penis and I do enjoy vaginas. I, I like the taste of both um, and I like to involve both of those in my bedroom play. So perhaps I would get bored of one flavor versus the other and, and so I do have an openness to, br to bringing both into the bedroom. I appreciate monogamy, I appreciate polyamory, I don't know where I will be in my life in the future. I think that monogamy is confusing and difficult and I I really appreciate it but I also appreciate everything else that isn't monogamy equally and I'm sick of 
on the note that I wrote to myself here, please do not tell me that all heterosexual people are having vanilla sex. I am so sick of people acting like the queer community is like having this fucked up sex life that, that straight people don't have. Like, it's just, it's bullshit to talk about that. And I'm, and I, I have like a huge passion for sex education and sex positivity. And the fact that those conversations are so intellectualized is definitely a deficit. I think that there are a lot of gay queer people that are having very vanilla sex at the same time. And what is vanilla sex? Like my vanilla sex to your vanilla sex is going to be very, very different. Maybe this isn't the time or the place to be talking about like what sex is and like what we like to do in the bedroom, but I mean like that's not the episode for that. Sounds like episode three was that. I haven't listened to it, but I will go home and listen to it. Um, my gender performance definitely shifts, and I want my partner's gender performing to performance to shift. I don't always want to be the dominant one. I don't always want to be the passive one. I want to be able to be tired sometimes. I want to be able to be aggressive sometimes. I want to be able to fuck someone. I want to be able to get fucked. I, I want. You're relating those things back to gender. To ge yeah, with gender. I I mean I think those those things relate to gender. I think that very, very often the stereotypical roles, because I am having sex with someone who has a penis and I have a vagina, so th those things play into gender, obviously, I mean, perhaps that's not obvious, but those things play into gender and the way that we use our body parts, I want to change and I want to be able to incorporate other body parts and toys into that in when I am dating women versus when I am dating men versus when I am dating um, trans people. I, I act differently, but I act differently like across the spectrum. On, on Monday, I might feel a certain way with any sort of person, just as t on the next day, I might feel differently. And I don't want to ever lose the space to do that. I don't want to ever lose the space to play with my gender and to, I mean, I, I always identify as female, but the way that I personify, the, the way that I act as a, as a female is going to vary from day to day. So perhaps I'm not playing with my gender so much as my, my presentation. This is Amy and things that I'm very attracted to uh, masculine energy and a balance of masculine, masculine and feminine energy, though I've noticed that more having the masculine trait more dominant than the feminine trait almost like a balance of where it's expressed, like the way that the person shows up. So I'm attracted to butch and soft butch females, I'm not really attracted to like more femme females. And then when the person is a cisgendered male, I can be really attracted to like the masculine, but then I also like a guy who'd be comfortable to put on a skirt or and be whether it be like androgynous or like cross-dressing. But then I also dated a very, very masculine trans man. So it's kind of, it, it definitely is a, a dominance in the attraction to masculine energy with that person being comfortable ex expressing their feminine energy and being like really good at communicating. Communication is huge for me, which some people see that as sort of the more feminine of the emotional type traits. My personal gender expression does change depending on the kind of person that I'm dating. I can be influenced by what they like to see. So if someone likes the more femme in the heels and that kind of stuff, I'll wear heels more. I was dating somebody that had some interest in people that were more comfortable with the variation of expression. And so that's brought out my interest. And also as I'm becoming more comfortable and expressing more that my presentation I'm like playing more with suits and stuff like that and just having fun with that although I'm still always the femme and and it's just like where my femme shows up and how dominant she is how, how dominant her presentation is and then how feminine she is it can shift depending on the, per, the person yeah the person that I'm with that wraps up GenderCast episode 16. Thank you to Maddox, Kayla, and Amy for being on this episode with us. And 
you can leave comments on the Facebook page or the blog post, and we will definitely put you in touch with them if you have specific questions for them, and I'm sure we'll be asking them back at one point or another. So we're just building the group of people that can come on GenderCast and weigh in. So we appreciate that, and I'll just leave you with one question. Is bisexuality binary, or are we all just queer? Copyright 2012 GenderCast, our transmasculine gender query. All podcasts, content, and information related to these podcasts are the property of GenderCast producers and may not be used without their written consent. Contact GenderCast at gmail.com for written permission. I am just one into this world, but what the world might see isn't always me. Cause inside is a boy trying to break free. body or my soul he just wants to share this body make me whole cause the girl this world does see is only half of me i am not the only one born under this golden sun beneath the surface you will find the million thoughts that cross my mind I am born into this world brand new Start with knowledge small, takes time to learn it all Learn to live, leave it all behind Accept the different and find the peace of mind make us who we are what we know some of us are scared to let it show let it out scream this is me now is time that the whole world see i am not the only one born under this golden Beneath the surface you will find A million thoughts that cross my mind A million paths that can unfold